Thank you uh, for joining tonight's uh, virtual clinic. As ever, I am very grateful to all the world-class clinicians and researchers who are contributing to this series of webinars um, and are willing to give their time to this event. Uh, it's very, very generous of them. Um, we have a speaker tonight who's going to be talking uh, uh, in a few seconds. If you have questions during the, uh, the talk or afterwards, then please mm -hmm. use the chat function. Uh, and I will uh, read out your question during the Q&A session at the end of the talk. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, one of the potential um, contributors to uh, macular degeneration. AMD is still uh, in many ways a very mysterious condition. Uh, we know what the so-called risk factors are for macular degeneration, age, for example, certain genes, um, smoking uh, background possibly, but that's not really the same as actually understanding the causes of the condition. Now, there are lots and lots of theories, of course, about what causes macular degeneration. Um, but the ones that we're going to discuss tonight um, is the potential role of pollution in causing eye disease. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been several reports recently that have suggested that there may be a connection between air pollution and AMD. But what is the strength of this connection? What is it? actually tell us about this. My guest tonight is Professor Tunde Peter, who is Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology at Queen's University in Belfast, where she is also, of course, a consultant ophthalmologist in medical retina. That's the specialty, specialty uh, that includes age-related macular degeneration. She has a very wide range of research interests, including um, how we can use eye scans, um, OCT scans, for example, of the eye uh, and analyze those scans uh, to find out more about what causes blindness and how we might be able to prevent it. Um, this includes the use of artificial intelligence to analyze uh, all these eye scans. Uh, and she's been working with the UK Biobank project for some time now. This is um, a, a database and a resource of more than uh, data from more than half a million uh, patients around the UK. Um, uh, and as part of that work, she has been looking at this potential link between pollution and eye disease. So I'm gonna hand over now to Tunde to take us through her presentation uh, and explain to you a little bit more about the work she's been doing. Tunde, over to you. Thank you very much. And well. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it will work. It worked just before seven, so it's no good reason why it shouldn't. And is it full screen now? Yep. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Brilliant. So it's absolutely wonderful to, to, to meet you all. And um, I've been working with the Macular Society for, for quite a while now. And it's been an absolute joy to have these meetings uh, in, in Northern Ireland. We have them quite regularly and we join the regular group meetings as well. And also organized sort of quarterly meetings with, with larger groups. Today, I've been asked to talk about air pollution and age-related macular degeneration. But what I would like to emphasize as well, that it all takes time. So it's very difficult to, to pinpoint um, a lot of the, a lot of, in a lot of people, it's very difficult to pinpoint as to when macular degeneration starts. And the more we know about the disease, the more unlikely it looks that it is just governed by one or two factors. It's probably a very multifactorial disease. So today we will talk about the background to this project about UK Biobank and also um, the um, air pollution. I'm going to try to explain as to what is UK Biobank and what is it not, because that's very important for understanding the disease um, and the modalities that we are gonna be talking about. And then we'll look at what these results mean and how we need, what we need to do to take this research forward so we can use these results in our understanding of how to combat um, some of the aspects of the disease. What we can do better, even if we just reduce the risk by a little bit, it might be just enough for people not to end up with end-stage disease and lose sight. Because if we can reduce the progression of the disease, for example, by understanding issues that contribute to age-related macular degeneration, then you might have to live to 150 
to get visual loss. And concurrently, that would be perfectly fine because not very many of us will live to 150. My slides are not going anywhere, so that's it. So I thought some, some of you might remember that this is how we used to look at your eyes in the past. A lot of the times we would um, take this hattie and this is like a contraption that goes on, your, on our head. We would be looking into the eye and we would look, uh, we would have all of these colored pencils and we would draw these beautiful drawings. This is about um, a, a patient with diabetes, but you know it's very important to understand that this is where we came from. So a lot of our understanding of the disease comes from having been able to see the back of the eye, but it was one consultant or one clinician's word against the other as to what they have seen. And if you weren't a very good artist, then some of your drawings might not have been very helpful. And uh, if you ever be able to look at um, Terry Tarrant's drawings from uh, Morpheus, you know, he was an absolute um, genius of, of doing beautiful drawings. But this, is, this wasn't sustainable because of course this takes a lot of time. So over time, we ended up with cameras that can take images of the back of the eye. And this is when we really started to understand some of the diseases. But what I'm going to show you is that a couple of things we actually nearly forgot, and this might be very helpful for our future reference and future research as well. So I'm going to walk you through just in a minute or two, this patient's images who, who you will see why I said it all takes time. So this is the, the baseline image on the top left-hand corner. I know some of you might not have full vision. That's why I'm, I'm going to have some black and white images as well that might be easier to see. But these four images are the same patient, same, same eye, seven years apart. And these little yellowish spots, they are what we call drusen, and they are the hallmark of the disease. So if you have these yellowish spots in the back of the eye, then, then you are at risk of developing um, late disease and, and potential visual loss. But you can see that in seven years, this patient kept all his vision, but these yellow spots get growing and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And nine years later, they are even bigger. 10 years later, they take nearly the whole of the back of the eye and they cover this area in the middle, which is the most important area for vision. And you have to remember that all of this stage, the vision is still very, very good. So compared to the baseline images, 12 years later, an area of atrophy where the back of the eye died away, appears and this is when the vision was lost. So the reason why age-related macular degeneration is partly so difficult to understand because even with very advanced early disease, there is a lot of time before visual loss sets in. So there is lots of things that can happen during that period. And this is only when once the patient <clears throat> has all of these changes. So the end stage disease takes quite a while to develop and there will be lots of factors that you will, that and life influences that will happen during this period. People move, people live in next to a big road or they live in a very quiet area or people might live um, at several continents during this very long period of time. So what we do know also that we call it macular degeneration which is the top left-hand corner, the image on the top left-hand corner. There are lots of these yellow spots and some brown spots as well. That means that the disease is, is progressing. But if you look at the top, the bottom right corner, then you see that there are some, some of these yellow spots on the periphery as well. <clears throat> and there are quite a number of these blackish spots on the periphery. So the disease does affect the periphery as well. And some of you might notice that in the dark, you don't see as well. 
And that partly can also come from the fact that it affects the back of the eye, both in the center and in the peripheral retina as well. A lot of people have very symmetrical disease, but they might be at different stages. So one might be more advanced than the other. But if you put these two together, those of you even with slightly less vision, you might realize that these like ne nearly like mirror images and it's the same patient's two eyes and they look very, very similar. So what, what, what are we going to have to look at when we look for abnormalities and when we look at life influences and the influences of, 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 of factors around us in the disease? So nowadays we take wider image than these previous ones were. So I'm just going to show you again, this is just the, the back of the eye, the very center. These images called taken by the Optos camera. Some of you might have been imaged on this. This camera is very different. You don't put your chin on the chin wrist, but you nearly sort of put half of your head into the machine. So if you remember a machine like that, then you had this image taken. And you can see that in the very center, there are some very strange changes. These are the changes from a, from a neovascular disease where you would have had injections into the eye. But you see a lot of abnormality on the periphery as well, again, contributing to difficulties in the dark or being able to navigate in an unfamiliar environment. And that, and that also goes for, this is the, the black and white image that some of you with less vision might be able to see better. So this blackness in the very middle, that's an area of atrophy where the cells have died away and it's called geographic atrophy. If you have that, at the moment, we can't really offer good treatment for you other than having with help with vision, low vision and um, making sure that you, you use color and contrast to the best of your benefit. But you can see that the further out there to the left, there are some changes as well that are atrophies. So they, they died away there as well. So why does it matter to the topic of today? What I'm trying to illustrate is that what we call disease is actually very varied. And we need to be able to understand when the disease starts in order to make claims that something contributes to the disease. So some very kind um, people donated their eyes um, after, after their death. And we, we always thank you for, for even just the thought uh, of that. But what happens is on the top, you can, I don't really need you to understand this picture. What I need you to do is to see how many little dots of these black dots are on these drawings, even at someone who is 42 years of age. So even at that age, some, some early signs of age-related macular degeneration are visible in some eyes. So what happens is that this is, this is what we call Drusen. Remember that you, you've seen those very beautiful black big ones in the back of the eye. This is an electromicrograph and I absolutely love these pictures. <clears throat> it comes from a group um, work um, with Christine Corsia, Richard Thompson, Imbril Angel, and some of the, some of the others who, who work in this field and I'm very grateful for them to give me this picture. So these, these little concretions here that look very different, some of them looks like a little acorn, some are just dots, some look like a little bit of a brain. These are all tiny little drusen, little concretions that are in the back of the eye. And these ones help the, these, these ones help the drusen to be established. And that matters because these come quite early in life. So if you have early influences that will, that will help these to form, and we don't know why they form. So, you know, if those of you trying to write it into the chat box as to why they form, we don't really understand it just as yet. These are like little bony particles in the back of the eye. And we all know they shouldn't be there, but they are there. But this is, those of you who can see, this will tell you a whole story. So this one, the, the red ones are the red blood cells in the, in the 
vessel in the back of the eye, sitting on the membrane that, that will help to, to filter out nutrition, uh, bad nutrients and toxins and everything. And on the right hand side, these little concretions don't allow that, that oxygen and nutrients and everything goes through very well, this, uh, this membrane here. So you can imagine that if something is in the blood, such as some of these chemicals and environmental pollution factors, and it comes through and it sort of sticks to these little concretions, then you might end up with trouble of trying to get oxygen and nutrients to the actual retinal tissue that helps you see. So just, just um, very sort of schematically. So normally what would happen that in the healthy eye, there are no, these little concretions. But once this little one forms, everything sticks to it. This is like a, a fly paper, you know, that you put out, there is one fly stuck to it and then more and more and more and more. And then eventually these grow to the point where we can see them. So by the time we can see them on clinical examination, they might be actually quite big and they might have been developing for years and years and years, thanks to some of the environmental factors that are around us. So what is the UK Biobank? The UK Biobank is an amazing resource and it collects genetic and lifestyle information from about 500,000 people in the UK. It was a monumental task to, to set it up and it's the MRC, the Welcome, and quite a number of other um, leading um, organizations established it. And what happened is that in one visit, a couple of hours visit, you had a lot of examinations, a lot of uh, nutritional and other questionnaires and these would be collected. These, these sort of major hubs were parked in, in Tesco car parks and, and all over the place to make sure that people could get to it. So when we were asked as to what might be beneficial for the eye, then we needed to come up with a plan that would fit with, with this very fast throughput of large number of patients and so we have devised a protocol that allowed for vision to be taken, some questionnaires, vision related questionnaires to be filled in, intraocular pressure taken, you know, the one that you have at the optician as well, that the opticians a lot of the times do with the puff. And then, and then we have taken images of the back of the eye. So this image is a representative image as to what we had. So we, this is a, what we call the TopCon 1000 OCT machine, which is the left, the greenish colored um, slice is the OCT, optical coherence tomography. It is a little bit like shining a lot of light into the eye and the light sections the eye as if it would be cutting it up and then it generates this beautiful image. And on the right hand side is now you very well know that this is an, a back of the eye image of the right eye. So this is a perfect image. And of course, not everyone is perfect and not every imager could take very good images of everyone. So let's see how we ended up with the numbers that we have data on that we could use for the air pollution um, study. And these are this is the data that these are the data that you will be seeing in quite a number of other publications as well about the UK Biobank. So when we took the images, then we had to sort of um, use the, a certain program to cal calculate how thick these layers are. And you can imagine that these layers are very, very thin. So any, any amount of, of, um, of ish, any amount of problems with the analysis of the layers would have been uh, would have been very difficult to then to to um, analyze them. So if the image wasn't perfect, then we couldn't do it. And that's relevant because, of course, 
we can't if we can't analyze everyone then you don't always know what you are missing out on so the uk biobank recruited about 500,000 people we were asked to join a slightly later as, as I group. So we have some data um, on self-reported AMD on 115,000, nearly 116,000 people. And you have to remember that this is self-reported. So if people didn't know they had it or they would never been to an optician who would have told them because they had only early signs that we might have missed it. And imaging was available for 68,000 people because it took a while for the imaging to be um, ramped up, to be to everyone to be trained and to be able to take good quality images. And so not every image turned out to be good, mainly because sometimes um, the pupil was far too small or people had cataract or had an eye injury before and we couldn't take up an image. So about 52,000 people had good enough quality of these slices, the OCT slices for analysis. So, so who reported more AMD? Remember, this is self-reported. So you know, this is not very surprising that those people who reported knowing that they have AMD, age-related macular degeneration, they were older. More women reported it, but remember women also live longer. And more people who were from white background reported it. The one thing that we also have to remember about the UK Biobank, that this was not really a representative sample of the UK population. People tended to be slightly healthier than the average UK person. And so it might be that, that they weren't all very much represented. Um, every type of person who lives in the UK weren't represented. But those who lived in more deprived areas, they also reported more AMD. And we do know that deprivation, poor diet, poor nutrition, probably a little bit more smoking, um, they might also contribute to developing AMD. And we really, uh, the association with the smoking went in and out of, of being relevant. And I think that's partly because it was the worried well or more, more healthier people who came to, to the, to the uh, testing centers. And also there were a lot of participants who never actually smoked. So that, that slightly biased the sample towards the non-smoking. So I, I, I think, and, and also sometimes smoking comes together with lots of other issues, a bit of a, um, you know, more deprivation, poorer diet and things like that. So it's not always that easy to, to decipher what's going on. So how did we estimate the air pollution? So I have to say we didn't. These all came from published estimates. Uh, there, there are some amazing data around there. And some of these would be covering some of the tiny particles that were less than either two and a half micron or 10 micron. The smallest ones actually go the furthest within the body. And you, we can estimate the blackness that they leave on a surface. And this is the proxy for car black carbon pollution, the nitrogen dioxide and oxides, and then the geographic information system provided um, or the land use, traffic, and other topography data. And then there were certain years where there was an annual average pollution at participants' residential address. So not every year we had every data for. So this is what you have to remember this also, that this was a one-off association. So you can't say it's causative because we don't know that. But we only know that at that point in time, it's associated with, with our disease of interest. And that's, that's important to appreciate because, because we som it's sometimes quite easy to jump into a conclusion saying, oh yes, we know that this is causing it. Just because something is associated with a disease, so linked to it probably, that doesn't mean that it also caused it. 
so we, we really need to make sure that, that we, we use our words correctly, especially in the scientific literature. But even for us to understand how air pollution in certain years um, is linked and associated with the, um, with the disease itself. So the very small particles that are sort of the two and a half micron particles, if you had more of those associated, more, you were more exposed to those, then it increased the, the odds of how likely you were going to develop AMD. And the corresponding retinal thickness was, was uh, affected as well. So these tiny little particles can mainly come from, com from the combustion process. And they are able to reach the small airways and they get transmitted to the, into the blood so they can get to certain other organs as well. So you remember that I showed you that picture further up when the blood and these little part, little concretions in the back of the eye were only <clears throat> you know, separated by that very, very thin layer of that membrane. And the, and the main issue is that if these particles can get there, then they might be able to do some damage. So, but overall, how, how we need to interpret the results is not that easy. So we don't really quite understand how this, this, these little particles might be so relevant in, in being associated with the disease, not necessarily being causative of the disease. It might be that they have what we call an oxidative stress and inflammation pathway. So they just put your body under a lot of stress and the body just keeps making these really bad chemicals trying to fight stress. And the very detailed image analysis needed to be undertaken to get these results. So it's not like your optician can really have a look at the image and, and sort of find these tiny little layers and tiny little concretions. Unfortunately, we are not quite there yet with this. And as I said, we have no data on how long these exposures might have had to be there in order for us to have AMD later in life. And of course, we spend so much of our time indoor and indoor exposure might be completely different for every person, every house you have lived in, how dirty your ceiling is, you don't actually really know what's above um, your ceiling. And indoor air pollution was not measured and it might be something that we need to do in the future. Indoor air pollution, especially for women in the developing countries is, is an amazing problem. And they get really bad um, lung disease as well from burning car tires and everything they can lay their hands on in order to feed the family. So it might be something that we need to look at, especially if we are looking at some of the data sets coming from other parts of the world. So I would really like to say thank you to the UK Biobank and Sharon Chua who wrote the paper and also the whole of the UK Biobank I Envision group who's been amazing and Paul Foster and, and Andrew Lottery and the others for leading it. Part of the image analysis, at least for the big cohort, was enabled by a Macular Society grant, which we're very grateful for. And really, uh, in order for us to be able to, to come up with the results like this, it was a massive team effort. And just to give you an idea, we started this process in 2008, when we started tra training the people, starting tra taking images. We would be doing 24 hour quality assurance to make sure that every day we knew if any of the machine needed to be um, updated or needed to be serviced. So that was only possible because it was a, it was a huge team effort and, and it was, it's, it's unbelievable to start seeing these results. Thank you very much for your attention. Andy, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, 
if you have some questions and you would like to um, pop them into the chat, please do so. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll come to some of the uh, questions um, um, immediately. Um, today, I wondered the thing that struck me first of all is um, this oxidative stress um, issue. So this comes up quite a lot in AMD, doesn't it? Not least in relation to diet. And when you you talked about um, uh, people who who are um, uh, have um, less affluent backgrounds perhaps eat less fruit and veg for example so we know that diet has an impact on oxidative stress in the, in the body could you just explain how that how that is what what that what that's all about so so it's probably not a straight answer either but um, we we've been watching the literature on two fronts one of them is the nutritional supplement and we do know that the ARED study from the US showed that people who have had one eye with end stage disease, very advanced disease. If they were on supplements, then the second eye progressed ever so slightly uh, uh, slower. However, from the Dutch studies, we also know that those people who have had a healthy diet throughout life, they had less AMD. And they seem to have been more beneficial in the long run and remember your mom always said that, you know, you eat your greens. So I, I think she was right. I mean, moms usually are, but she was absolutely right about that. Because what happens is that <clears throat> greens such as kale, curly kale, broccoli, they have pigments in them that we can't produce. Similarly, the orangey pigment that you find in sweet potatoes and butternut squash, pumpkin, uh, mangoes, which is a bit expensive here, but um, lovely when you get them. So all of those orangey pigments, they're, they, they're very protective for the eye. So if you have a varied diet, which is full of, um, full of um, pigments and nutrients, then the eye will be much more protected from, from the, the damaging rays and the damage, and the damage by, by other chemicals. The problem really is, and I'm sure you noticed it, that fruit and veg has gone up in price quite a bit. Not everyone can digest things like kale, curly kale and broccoli. They can be quite hard on, on, on the digestive season uh, system. So, so it's very important that we have, uh, we, we look at it again in the continuum and that's why it's it, the having the bio, biobank is so exciting because they're doing some follow-ups now. So we will be able to see if we might be able to put some of these associations, which is like one time point into a progressive progression of the disease or progression of, of um, environmental factors and, and figure out what's happening to people over time. It's a fantastic resource, isn't it? Um, the, the the biobank. And um, you mentioned that people in um, who who took part in in it tended to be healthier. They were a self selecting volunteer group, so they weren't they weren't picked to be diverse particularly. Um, you said they were healthier than than um, non than the average Brit <laughs> is healthier. Why why would that be? Do you think why why would that uh, fall that way? So we, we see it a lot of the times in other studies as well that people who volunteer for some of these big studies, they might be more socially aware or they might be more, more um, willing to help and they might have a slightly different view on life or they are simply just not as snowed under with surviving um, than some of, some, some of those who, who might be just really in, in a lot of difficulty and they, they just want to get on with everyday life and they really can't concentrate so and and this is this is absolutely no criticism you you will see that um i don't know if you ever seen a couple of the studies in in sugarcane workers so sugarcane workers in the caribbean they get their salary pretty much once a year so it's it's like either famine or or you know everything and their, their diet is significantly different and their outlook in life, just as to what they might volunteer for, what they might do, 
and the times when they have the money and it's not just the money it's the security and and the 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 or the sort of social well-being that it gives you that you are you 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 sort of if you if you have that you're more likely to be volunteering and also because the the testing took quite a while two three hours so if you were very sick or you weren't very well you probably thought that you know i can't really sit through that much so so these are the factors that contributed um to to the self selection that's that's um that all makes uh, perfect sense um uh, somebody's put on, on on the chat that they believe that they were affected by a pollution event of, of some of some sort um is it is it plausible that um, a, a single short term but perhaps rather significant exposure to pollution could um put the body under enough s s oxidative stress to cause causes um, or, or is it more likely that it would be a chronic exposure over many months or years? Is there any theory, any hypothesis uh, over this yet? No, not really. And and it would be um, so. So it's a AMD as as you could see from my pictures. It can take very long time to develop, and you usually have a lot of very sort of you, you, a lot of people have a lot of minor factors contributing to it i can't rule it out because i don't know enough of of like how one event would affect it i don't know what was in the pollution and that's the other thing that we do know that different pollutants affect the eye and the body differently so the smallest ones are the ones that travel around more freely the bigger ones and the ones that we usually see or or know about it um, it, they 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 might not travel as freely as far because they get caught in the in the in the lung. So it, I think I think you need to keep that in mind that we we don't know enough about this. Just like we don't know enough about indoor air pollution, and and that is an important factor because we spend so much time indoor. It is. I, I mean, I have to say, I have no idea what's on or above my ceiling. I mean, that you've now got me very worried. I now need to go, go and check what's in and above my, my in and above my ceiling. So there's a lot of interest in 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 air pollution generally now, hasn't there? Isn't there particularly, obviously, in relation to um, fatal lung conditions uh, and excess death death rates when in areas of of high high pollution? Do you think we take this subject seriously enough yet? And I think COVID taught us a lesson or two because people started taking their own surroundings more seriously and if they could. And, and also they started looking out of the window and, and looking for birds and making sure that um, the flowers grew. So I think we, we, this, is, this, is, this is a time when we can really look at um, how it's affecting us. And it will be interesting to see if in a few years time there will be less um, less chronic lung disease potentially, you know, amongst those who didn't have long COVID. I don't know, some, some people say that more cigarettes sell, so people have been smoking slightly more apparently, although that's very um, unreliable data at the moment. Some people say it, people smoke more. more Others say they don't. I think there are probably are two groups: some people who, who really take an on healthier lifestyle, and others who, who couldn't cope or or just went back on the on the smoke. So, so I think that we will we will have a lot more data in a few years' time, and we will be able to see also if if um, our patients who we had pictures from before COVID in five years' time if they develop. AMD with the same speed having been in the lockdown. It's been difficult to get good fruit and veg as well. So, so that might be also that people ate slightly more processed food, especially if you've been shielding or self-isolating and you might not have been given, you know, Tesco might have sent you 
some some replacement or some of the other supermarkets also sometimes it was very difficult to to order and and get what you what what anyone wanted because there would be nothing in on the on the shelves so the other thing that that it really taught us is is how important are clues um on um on on virtual clues i don't know how you found it or might have been even more difficult than than for me but supermarkets put in the the arrows for one way streets and or one way um lines and of course they sometimes changed it so i remember sort of popping in on my way home from clinic you know just slipped in like one minute before closure to get something to eat and the lines were just completely changed compared to the previous day and of course everyone shouted at me that i'm going down the wrong way but if you have poor vision or if 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 you're not sort of quite as socially aware or you sort of use a cane as well i'm sure it was um it was very difficult to cope with some of those changes. Yes, absolutely. I think that's that's certainly right. I think. Um, uh, interesting questions come up on on the chat. Has there been any um, uh, and study of of um, people in particular occupations like coal mining, for example, to see whether um, being being exposed to that sort of environment for years has anybody done any anything looking at particular occupations like coal mining to see if they have a bigger incidence of um, prevalence of AMD? So I don't know about coal miners. There are some sort of, um, there were some studies on nurses and some of the other um, occupations. What, what you, what we have to remember that some of these, some of these professions where you would expect a lot of exposure, they're not good for your lungs or your heart either. So life expectancy in the mines have never really been that great. So, so a lot of people died before they could get end stage disease. Therefore, we don't really know how they were affected. But I can see it in the chat that the building techniques. So that's been that's an interesting one because because uh, yes, uh, we we we've been we've all been in houses where you would you know the uh, the coal was um was stored in the attic and um and that would be very interesting to see because nobody went up there and um and vacuumed all of that coal suit out so yeah we do know that people who have open fires but especially in the lower middle income countries and they cook on it they do have many more lung and other chronic diseases that that might be linked to these very small particles that travel around in the body. Um, it, it makes you think again about smoking, doesn't it, which is a form of voluntary pollution of your entire system, isn't it, by inhaling, inhaling cigarettes, cigarette smoke, which um, is a product of combustion, as you talked about earlier, um, contains all these chemicals and presumably these similar sorts of particles. Yes, so so we do know that smoking is very much associated with with AMD, and 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 it's in any case it's good for for the body the less we smoke. It's um, because it it will also. Um, protect the lung and the vascular system and, and heart and the brain and everything else. So it can only be good for us. Um, but um, but there, is, there is not always a straight association and that's why it's so important to, to look at every other aspect of someone's life and include the genes, which is one thing that, that, that wasn't included in this, in this study just as yet, but the UK Biobank is producing all the gen genomic data as well. So we will be able to run some of these associations again to see if any of the genes would be linked to how we might be able to react to some, some of these small particles. You, some, some of us might do better than others, depending on what our genetic uh, background is. Can we just talk a bit again a bit a bit about more about drusen? So 
Mm -hmm. These are cl clearly very important in the development of, of AMD and um, emerge um, as a response to the sort of very earliest stages of the disease. Is that, we, we don't really know whether, whether Drusen, uh, Drusen, well, Drusen appear in the early stages, don't they? That's, that's clear, that's clear. Yeah. we all know that. But there, but there are different types of Drusen, aren't there? Um, can you just tell, tell um, and are there particular types that are more associated with this, these small particle pollutions, do, do you think? Or, or are they just triggering this cascade that happens that um, Drusen start and then they develop uh, in different ways. And then we have this, this very interesting type of Drusen called the reticular pseudo Drusen, don't we? Perhaps you could just talk us through the different types of Drusen because it's a very interesting area, I think. So <clears throat> we used to think that Drusen is a Drusen is a Drusen, uh, but it's, it's not really. So we, it's, it's, we don't have necessarily enough images where we would be able to say that this bigger Drusen would definitely have grown from a smaller ones. But when you look at someone like this patient I shown, I've shown you at the beginning, you can see that the areas um, that have where the Drusen grew, they, they looked like that they're growing and they're coalescing. What I showed you also that these little tiny particles that were in the back of the eye, they sort of act like a glue. And then every sort of junk and waste material will stick to those and they, they will be growing. So the process of a drusen starts way before we can actually see it. And that's probably why by the time we see it, a few years, within a few years, they become bigger and they will become um, more and more prominent. And then eventually, because they act like a barrier between, between sort of cleaning the back of the eye from, from the waste material that we all produce there, they, it can't go away. And then it will affect our, the way how our retina can function, the, the, the very sensitive layer in the back of the eye. So some of these drusen will be will be sort of more likely to give you the end stage disease and some and these are the bigger ones the the pseudo um, um, the the drusen that we are talking about and then others will well if they remain very small and they don't grow as much then the likelihood of developing um, end stage disease either atrophy or neovascularization is lower. There is a very funny type drusen. It really, really just looks like a crystal. Once you have those crystalline drusen, the eye pretty much always goes into atrophy. So the cells will die away. And there are, even if we believe, if we can provide treatment for the neovascular stage when you get injections into the eye, Unfortunately, we can't treat atrophy at the moment. There are lots of clinical trials in the, and in, 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 then there are lots of clinical trials that, um, that have been looking at treating geographic atrophy. And I'm sure that eventually they will crack the, the treatment of death as well, just because there are so many people out there with, um, with 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 atrophy that we, we are unable to to treat uh, a question has come in would a regular eye examination pick up drusen and warn of the possibility or likelihood of AM, amd yes if they if if the drusen is is big enough and um they will see it the question always is as to and it's 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 all it's with every disease as to at which point the disease is a disease and not just some age-related change that we all get. And some people react better to some unexpected diagnosis than others. And some people, some of the optometrists or ophthalmologists, they can present it better than others. So we don't really want everyone to be going home thinking that, um, you know, I might go blind because as you could see from, from the images I showed you, even from a very large amount of Drusen, it took 12 years before some visual loss 
set in, and that amount of Druzen would have taken 20, 25 years to develop. So, so and, and in 20 years or 15 years, a lot of people can get other diseases as well. You might get something else that will, you know, you might get glaucoma or diabetes or an eye injury or a retinal detachment. There are lots of other diseases that might give you visual loss, sometimes much before that tiny little drusen can grow up. So I think we noticed certainly on the advice service um, at the Macular Society that more people are being diagnosed with very early stage disease. And this yeah. is partly, I think, because optometry practices increasingly have OCT machines themselves, yeah. don't they? And, and funders photography is now uh, all, is ubiquitous pretty much, isn't it now? And I, and I guess when an optometrist sees Drusen, they feel compelled to, uh, to, to, to inform, inform the patient. Um, we, in fact, produced a leaflet on early AMD in order to um, try to give people the right level of information mm -hmm. for a very early stage, just a few Drews and, um, you know, if they, they get the, the, the same leaflet that people with late stage disease get, it's going to um, yeah. be very concerning in, in, indeed. So this, I think we do recognise that this is, um, this is a trend uh, and the co communications we feel with patients with very early stage disease could be um, improved on very many occasions, I think. Um, That's completely true, sorry, sorry, Kathy. Just because um, it's the same as when people get told that they have a little bit of a cataract. It's, it's cataract is also an unknown beast in that sense. Sometimes it develops very quickly. Sometimes it takes 50 years to develop to the point that it takes the vision um, away a bit. So so it's, it's very good to have that leaflet to, to to have people to put it in perspective. And sometimes, and, and you're absolutely right, patients used to get the either the end stage disease leaflet or nothing, and then they would go home and Google it. And then all of these injections come up um, into the eye, which a lot of people will not progress to. Yes, I mean that that's 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 absolutely right. Yeah, and 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 if and if, if somebody in their mid 90s is diagnosed with early stage macular degeneration then you know it, it may be that they never uh, have any sight loss in their Absolutely. life Absolutely. Um, uh, are there names a question are there names for the different types of drusen i think large small soft and hard yeah. <laughs> yeah. so we we call them based on their appearance which might have nothing to do with how they would look if we could just ha get the, our hands on them and cut them up. So the very small ones, we call them small hard drusen, and then intermediate, and then soft and larger soft. And there are some very, um, very funny big ones as well. And sometimes they can look very similar in some of the genetic diseases as well, which, which are completely different. Um, completely different disease but in in reality the size and the appearance as to how fluffy they look and or how crystalline they look that will that helps us to to understand the likely path that the eye might take but of course it can be modified by so many unknown factors that sometimes we get caught out so we always um, try to be realistic as to what to expect. So there's quite a lot of this, these crystalline drusen, are these what I've called the reticular pseudo drusen, is that? So the crystalline that? ones really glisten. They're really like tiny little crystals in the back of the eye. They're very, very pretty, um, but they, they, a lot of the times, most of the time they go into atrophy. Reticular pseudodrus, they, they, they look like an, a lacy pattern in the back of the eye. And they, they're not quite, they, they can be quite difficult to see on color fundus photography. That's why we probably underestimated its appearance, its, its prevalence of how often they come and how much they might contribute to disease. Uh, when we only had um, color fundus photography for the early trials in macular degeneration. So all these scans and all this work with the biobank, um, 
uh, artificial intelligence is becoming quite an important way of analyzing this quantity of these yeah. quantity of data. It's just so much data that actually, you know, a handful of highly trained researchers going through that, it would take 100 years. But artificial intelligence can speed this process up. Is that right? Yes. So, so there are there are a couple of things. This is a fantastic image set for for training and validating some of the artificial intelligence, because of course artificial intelligence, although it can learn, but it learns quicker and it learns better if you have what we call the ground truth, and that's usually human grading still. So. You might not need to do the whole set to train up your artificial intelligence, but if you don't do any, it might go off on a tangent and will, you know, identify a pool of, you know, um, sort of a lovely lake in the back of the eye or something, because that's what it's seen before on the internet. So, so it's important that we, we work with them. So we've done a lot of work on, on AMD and diabetes and glaucoma. In, in on these images, uh, just to make sure that that those softwares are well trained and they actually give you the diagnosis and the understanding that that we all need. It's it's a wonderful developing area of science, isn't it? Um, we are um, hoping to um, have a conference on uh, the use of artificial intelligence in ophthalmology later on in the year. Um, and I think uh, I think that's going to be a really interesting, uh, really interesting subject. And um, Tony, we're running out of time, I'm afraid. So we're going to have to um, close uh, now. But I'm so grateful to you for giving up your <laughs> precious evening uh, when there's so much going on in clinics uh, uh, and in research. But um, it's been an absolute um, fascinating and great pleasure to have you as a guest. So Tony, thank you very much indeed for joining us this week. Um, next uh, month. Um, I advertised inaccurately that we'd be talking about beer view tonight and I was completely wrong, but we are definitely talking about beer view at the um, May virtual clinic. A beer view is a new treatment that's just um, being introduced now for wet macular degeneration and it's a longer lasting treatment. That is the, uh, that is the claim of this. Uh, and my guest next month will be Professor Farouk Ganji from the Bradford Teaching Hospitals, who has been one of the leading uh, investigators in the trials of beer view in the UK arms of those trials. And so he will be our guest on Tuesday, the 18th of May at the usual time of seven o'clock to talk about uh, beer view. So I do hope you can join us then. Tunde, thank you very much indeed for being with us this evening. And thank you to everybody who has joined tonight's virtual clinic. Don't forget, you can see it again on the uh, on our website. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you could also pass on the details to anybody else you think would be interested in uh, seeing any of our virtual clinics. They are all there for you to uh, uh, look at and share again. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, have a very good evening, everybody. And I hope to see you next month. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone.